everybody and welcome to the Build Better Stuff podcast where we talk about the potential of the built environment, the fact that it could be better uh, and all of our guests on this podcast join us to talk about their particular issue and today we are thrilled to be joined by Mark, the Chief Executive of Moby. Hi there. Hi Catherine, pleasure to be here. Excellent, thank you so much for joining us Mark. Can I ask you to tell our listeners a little bit about yourself please? Okay, uh, yeah, happily so. I've um, so I guess I've had a career in the built environment. I um, I was a geographer to start off with. Loved geography at school and went on to do geography at uh, degree level. And in my final year at degree level, I found uh, a, there was a module on British and overseas planning, and that's what decided me that I wanted to be a planner. Uh, and that's pretty much what I've been ever since. Uh, planner ever since then, and focus on the built environment since then as well. Uh, very career. So I worked in local government for a bit uh, and did a part-time planning degree while doing that. Uh, then I worked for the Royal Society of Protection of Birds as their head of planning for quite a while, which is a, an unusual role, but think about how you can protect habitats and species through the planning system. Uh, then I worked for the Environment Agency, uh, working on planning and flood risk in particular, which is obviously a very current issue at the moment, for how to avoid building homes and businesses in the floodplains, uh, and if they are at flood risk, how to prevent them, prevent flooding through protection or how to enable them to adapt quickly, uh, and also focus a bit on climate change there. Uh, I then worked for the Planning Inspectorate, looking at national infrastructure uh, and appeals, and now I'm with Moby, focusing on the built environment more widely, particularly homes and how we can make homes better for the future. And that's what you're joining us today to talk about, isn't it? About homes and housing and the possibilities there. Yeah, we th so we need, so the UK, maybe picked it up, needs a lot more homes. Uh, we've got a real issue around people having to sort of struggling to afford homes. We need to build more homes make them more affordable um, and we yeah, in doing that we need to make sure those homes are really fit for the future so they're fit for the people who want to use them and how our needs are going to adapt uh, and that they're they're fit for uh, the climate change issues that we face as well and they're not contributing towards it so we have a big big challenge to build lots more homes and we have a big challenge to build them in a lot better ways than we have done in the past. When you say better are there specifics there that you're talking about? Yeah, so I think, I mean, we talk in the industry or in, in housing about place making a lot and, and place is just sort of how good does, does somewhere feel? Does it feel like somewhere you want to live or does it feel like somewhere you would rather not live? And actually it's really about, yeah, good place making is about creating really good places where people want to live. That's the starting point. Um, but then for, in terms of homes, it's thinking about, well, how our needs going to change? Um, you know, just think about how telephone technology has changed in the last 15 years or you know all the things we're doing now which we wouldn't have believed we were doing at the same time. We need our homes to be able to adapt like that and actually at the moment they don't really. And then I guess the final thing I, I, I've mentioned is climate change. We've really got to make sure those homes are, um, are not going to contribute to climate change and deal with increased temperatures or flooding or whatever it might be and that they are able to um, you know, support people as their needs change. Is the dog a problem? He's barking, but he should stop it a minute. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fine. What, what I'll do in the edit afterwards is just put some sort of enrichment noise in the background, which just, just means that you can't hear anything specific. And then he should quieten down until the postman <laughs> arrives. <laughs> the <laughs> hazards are working from home. <laughs> in a few minutes' time, the school next door to me breaks for morning break until the people screaming. <laughs> I love that sound. Actually, I, I grew up. My parents' home was sort of near a school, and that sound of children running around having fun at playtime is just such, and I'm quite close to primary school, actually, and I just love that sound. It takes me back to my childhood. So, yeah. <laughs> it's a whole different break time to when you were an older child, when it was almost more train home and more cool. These are kids just literally screaming, letting out all of their energy. Yeah, burning energy. And the daylight's day with the sun as well. It's just fantastic. So, yeah. <laughs> right, I think the, um, if you hold on for a minute, I think the... Um, Yeah, I can hear him going now, so you should be all right now. Okay, fantastic. Obviously, your background in planning and being part of the built environment over years and, and an interesting geography as well has helped you to understand how embedded this problem is. Can you give us some context to how the housing problem came to be what it is? Because there, you know, there have been 
population needing housing for decades and, and has it always been like this or is it a new thing? Yeah, of course. Um, I, I, I mean, if it was a simple problem, there would be a simple solution. And I think the fact we haven't got to a solution yet is because it's a, a multi-layer problem. I mean, in short, we've just not been building enough houses to meet meet demand. Um, so, uh, and that will be for a, a number of reasons. That's the industry to do so, um, because uh, some people object to having housing. So actually getting housing uh, through planning permission to start off with before you build it could be quite difficult. Uh, and reality is we haven't done that. And as a result of that, um, I mean, there, there's a there's a really interesting table, which I think Shelter and others have produced, which shows sort of in the mid-1970s, we were probably doing all right. Um, but since that time, the numbers have collapsed. And actually, largely, those numbers have collapsed because we don't build council housing anymore. So uh, Margaret Thatcher brought in the right to buy in the mid-1980s, which in, in principle was not a bad thing. If you owned, a, if you had a council house, you had the right to buy that at a, a reduced rate. But what didn't happen was we didn't replace the houses you bought, which has basically meant a collapse in council housing, and you can trace that. So pretty much the, the, the um, private house builders, the house builders you see out there, have been doing the same amount forever. Uh, what we've seen is a collapse in council housing, and there's a bit of a, a bit of a sort of coming back of that now. People are talking about more council housing, uh, more council houses being built. Um, if you know architecture, there's something called the Sterling Prize, which is the top uh, UK prize in architecture. And last year, a council house scheme won that, which is unheard of, uh, which real real marker and change in terms of both the, the quality of the scheme, but actually the fact that you know a council's putting investing a lot of money in really high quality uh, housing and that is very interesting from an architectural point of view that actually council housing has that connotation of being fairly low quality or certainly aesthetically unappealing um you know it, it, it's sort of synonymous with with really dreary estates or, or places that lack imagination where you were talking about placemaking before it it doesn't have that vibrant feel to it is that something that you think is is coming back in in the whole council house planning i mean i think something which needs to come back across all sectors and actually you know you could look at a lot of modern housing estates and maybe say the same about those they're not as good as they could be uh, but i think it was a real game changer for i mean the sterling prize is normally won by one-off amazing buildings um, you know, in, in London or, or you know, elsewhere, and actually for a council house scheme to win it was amazing. I think for the local authority to invest in that, but they just invest in a quality place because they really care about, uh, you know, what the lives of the people who live in those houses are. They they own that stock. Those people will continue to rent from them, and they want them to have the best, you know, the best lives possible to live in a grow up in a fantastic place to. Uh, be able to afford their heating bills and therefore try and keep their heating bills down by good you know, uh, insulation and uh, good use of technology. So, so there is a start of this, and I think you know, I think councils and, and housing associations, which is another element of, of sort of public sector um, housing, housing not by private companies, are really interested in what's the livelihood for what's the life like for the people who live in them. It's quite a, quite a difference actually. The private house builders, most of them, can build houses. And as soon as they sell them, they've lost the interest, and actually, then it's your your interest to sort of carry on uh, and look after those houses and, and any issues they might you might have with them. For the council and housing association sectors, they retain those houses and therefore are very interested in what the experience of their their occupiers are. And I think that that understanding of what it's like to live in a property is just as important as what it's like to see it from the outside and to interact with your neighbours and your community, that fuel poverty is has historically been a very significant factor as energy prices keep rising. Inefficient buildings become really hard to, to heat or to ventilate and, and people who are in that housing with, with limited options of where else they can go find themselves financially in a really challenging situation. So, yeah, we need to tackle it for two reasons. We need to tackle it for fuel poverty. Um, uh, you know, we shouldn't be making people heat inefficient homes. Um, but, but ally to that and it, you know, it partners it is we should not be having inefficient homes because we cannot afford to waste the energy that we use. So uh, our energy resources are precious, uh, becoming more so, and therefore creating houses which are as energy efficient as possible um, uh, should be what we aim for. 
and and the thing is we can do it actually and we don't it doesn't necessarily cost cost a lot more to do it either so uh, people may have heard of passive house which is just one example where actually the heating bills you may at the end of the year end up exporting more energy to the, to the grid than you use you'll actually use hardly energy at all your fuel bills will be really low and that's great for the occupiers because that's money they can then spend on food and other things rather than the heating bills but it's great for the environment too so um yeah i guess we're really focused on um funny really with housing it's one of the most expensive things that people ever buy in their lives probably the most expensive thing and yet actually the customer focus on it is sometimes really poor um so we just want to see customers uh, and that's you know future generations particularly having a bigger say of what those houses look like and, and how they perform and, and, and you know what what those places are where those houses are so actually provide much better places for people in the future Fantastic. That's something I think that our audience, I'm sure, will will understand or be starting to recognise for themselves. That the impact of this reduction in housing, this, this lack of available housing, means that rent prices are going up, accommodation seems to cost more than usual. Do you have any other examples of the sort of impact that this might be having on people's lives? Um, yeah, so I mean, there's, I mean, people may have heard of sofa surfing. So actually, there's, yeah, well, the obvious part of homelessness is the homelessness network, of which there is far too much. And that's, that's an issue around, partly around lack of housing, and partly around people find themselves in circumstances where they need more support. Uh, and it's not just a matter of housing, it's a support network that goes with it. But beyond that, there's massive hidden homelessness. So that's people living at home with their parents longer. Um, people may be cohabiting with with friends when they would rather live on on their own or with their partner. Um, people, as I said, sofa surfing who actually you know, go between friends' houses and literally using the sofa. It, it's, it, it does what it says on the tin uh, and doing that, and they are therefore homeless, but they don't have a home. So there's a lot of lot of uh, issues around which is not providing enough. There's a bit. Of, there's also a bit around for the private house builders. They don't want to build too many homes because if they build too many then supply becomes um, uh, overinflated and that reduces prices. So they have an interest in keeping the prices at a certain level. So as I said, at the, um, in relation to that, that diagram, you know, private house builders have been drilled in roughly the same for, for decades. Um, and I don't see that increasing. So exactly how do the housing associations and the councils build, build more to try and reduce those, those costs? Having said that, it's not going to be overnight. We've got ourselves no problem in the biggest decades. Yeah. Yeah, it's the government saying we need to build around 300,000 houses every year um, from the middle of this decade to 2025 onwards. Um, we're currently doing about 230,000 on our best year. So at, at best, we are 70,000 short and probably more like 100,000 houses short per annum. So you can see we've got a lot, lot, of, uh, lot more houses to build. Absolutely. And as populations grow every year, the, the issue is compounded, I imagine, that, that people become, uh, and, and family dynamics and things change, the, the family unit changes, so people need different types of accommodation at different points in their lives as well. Yeah, so, so one of the things that Moby does, we do um, young people's design challenges, and uh, we've got the current one we're running is the Home of 2030, and I can talk about that in a minute. But the, the one we ran previously with the Construction Innovation Hub was around uh, modular building and how a modular house um, might enable you to change as, as time went on. So you might start by being a single person in a, in a dwelling, um, then you maybe get a partner, then maybe you get a family. Um, then maybe your grandparents come and live with you because that's the best thing you can do. And the house has expanded in each of those phases. But then maybe you know, grandparents, sadly, um, are no longer with us and the family changes and the children go and you're back down to a smaller unit again. And, and how could you create through modern technology a house that can adapt to scale in terms of doing that? And it was great to see some of the, the, the wonderful designs that, uh, that the youngsters came up with. Um, and that's a real challenge, actually. And if you look, think about our current housing stock, it's very, um, it's anything but dynamic. It's very fixed and actually modular. Um, building houses in a different way offers an opportunity to maybe put some adaptability to those, those, those dwellings, which we don't have now. Let's move on to how you're tackling this, because I think you've set the scene perfectly there for young people to perhaps feel inspired about how they can be confident in it's not just about the the skills of plumbing and electricity and playing. It's actually some of the mindset and the attitude in thinking about how things can be different. And I know that that's something that Toby is really interested in. 
so um, yeah, so maybe it was set up by um, George Clark, which, who some of you may know. He's the he's one of the architects on Panel Four, sort of after Kevin McLeod, and then came along George, and George does a number of programs on Panel Four, um, which uh, which are really watchable. So do watch them if you get the chance. Uh, if you're interested in architecture and built environment, um, but he is absolutely passionate about two things. He's passionate about the home. He describes it's most most important piece of architecture in our lives, and I think he's absolutely right. And he thinks that the home can be so much better. But he's also passionate about young people and giving them an opportunity to to get into the, the built environment industry that he's got into and has, has enjoyed for you know, all his career and, and hopefully into the future as well. And Moby brings those two things together. So this is a charity he set up, and we're really here to do three things: to to provide um, engagement in terms of opening people up to the possibilities of uh, you know the built environment and, and making them more aware and, and seeing there might even be a career for them in the built environment and that's sort of the design challenges we do then there's education um, and we're really keen to try and open up education uh, in home building and home designing in a different way so we've created everything um, a sort of pathway from uh, BTEC diploma certificates uh, degrees if you want to go that far even PhDs and MSCs uh, but basically in a different way of thinking about home, home building. Um, so around design, think about design in, in, a, in a broader sense. Um, des the design industry is a massive industry if you think about it. Think about your phone uh, and those different designs and particularly an Apple phone and how much an, an Apple product is about the design as it is as much about functionality. Yes, it's a phone, but it's a lovely thing to have and possess. And actually, we'd love to see that sort of thing coming into house building, people loving their homes more uh, rather than just sort of tolerating them maybe. Um, so so that's, that's that element. And then research and development is the third element, uh, element of what we want to do. Um, funny, in many other industries like phones or cars or probably any other consumer product you can think of, there is massive amount of research and development going on to improve those products, change them, evolve them, make sure they meet customers' needs, really understand the customers' needs. I think our argument is in the house building sector, actually, there's a lot of that. Uh, for a start, customers' needs don't always come at the front, um, actually. Uh, and actually, there's not a lot of improvement going on in many other industries. We want to bring that thinking into housing in the same way you would see it in, uh, in phones, in computers, in cars, in probably aircraft. You know, think of almost anything, actually. Uh, they're doing better than house building is, and that's the wrong way around. We should have house building at the top. And as you say, not only is it a really expensive investment that people make in their lives, it's also something you have for much longer than you would ever have a phone or a pair of trainers or some other consumer good that, that has one after a thousand minutes. You know, you might have this home for 50 years and it might never be fit for purpose. Yeah, so so exactly. So we um, we live in a more disposable culture, and we probably need to we need to move away that for, for that from sustainability reasons, and and maybe hang on to things a bit longer. But home is definitely one thing you'll 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 ha have for many many years. And then you know when you no longer live there, somebody else will move in there, so it, it carries on. You know the homes we put, well look at the homes around you. Look at the Victorian homes, which is standing. The Georgian homes, yeah, they're hundreds of years old, you know, many hundreds of years old in some cases. Um, the ones which didn't stand the best of time have been demolished and rebuilt, but actually, again, we can't afford to do that. We want to build, build homes which are brilliant and last for hundreds of years and people love living in. And that's a very straightforward ask. It's actually quite a difficult thing to achieve, but, but we want to help young people have a real say in what those homes in the future look like. And it sounds like you've got some fant uh, fantastic submissions for your competition entries, which we'll come on to in a minute. Um, can I ask about the sort of reactions that you've experienced, perhaps, from the industry who created perhaps some of these problems in the first place, or, or perhaps the influencing industries on that politics, economic, some of the reactions that you've had from people to the idea of change? Yeah, it's, it, it, it is a challenged industry, there's no doubt about that, um, because you, you're sort of, we're sort of saying, well, we don't think what you're doing is good enough and it could be better. Um, and there are some who, as with any change, saying, no, everything's fine, it's okay, we don't need to change. I think that's a relatively small amount. Even within the industry, I think a lot of people are recognising the need to change, and some of the major companies are changing. So they are uh, designing better. They're thinking about different ways of building homes, which might be more efficient. Um, so, so that is beginning to happen on a small scale. But needs to happen more. Um, so, yes, there is a you know some of what we're saying is is a bit of a challenge. But actually, if you talk to the general public, a lot of them would say actually the homes we're building aren't good enough, and they could be a lot better. And they don't feel like they 
you know, if you look at a, uh, a new development on the edge of a town, it doesn't necessarily feel like it belongs to that town. It could have come in from anywhere. You could have dropped it from anywhere. Um, some people say, yeah, say they, they you could set the challenge of dropping somebody in on a housing estate somewhere in the country and you know, asking them to, to stay where they are. Um, it would be quite difficult. Mm -hmm. So there are opportunities to you know, build things more in a local character, build things, uh, places which reflect the, the places better and aren't just the standard identity. So I think um, whilst we are challenging ind industry, a lot of the public support this. Um, there are figures which say, although there are figures which say the people who buy new homes are really satisfied with them, there are also figures which say about 80% of people would not consider buying a new home, which is, you know, if that were the same for a car or for, for a phone or something else, would be quite shocking, really. That, 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 that tells me the product needs to improve. Um, people's experience of it tells me the product needs to improve. There's actually quite a lot of publicity recently about the quality of some of those homes when they're built. People talk about snags. So snags is when they haven't quite got the product right. And it's it'd be like if, I don't know, the, the button on your mobile fell off, or these days you don't have a button, but the touch screen wasn't working. Well, that's the equivalent in terms of housing when they talk about snagging. And there's a lot of new homes, real issues in terms of their end quality, uh, which is another reason why we're interested in picking up things from other industries like car making, where a car, a car manufacturer would never allow cars to go off with, with major defects, uh, at least not ones they know about. Yeah, and they test it before it leaves the factory. And that's when maybe he's quite interested in factory built housing as opposed to housing built out on sites, because that gives that great potential to um, have a much better product leaving the factory before you assemble it. And then get that consistency and quality to make sure that you've got very low tolerance of, of those kind of problems of the touchscreen not working, that if you have those products, you, you would change the production line. Absolutely. So, so you'd have real in-time information which tells you that, you know, that, that something has gone wrong on, on that line and actually you need to solve it. So first of all, it would never go out of the, ha of the factory with a, with a, a known problem. Uh, and we can't always say that on building sites. So people can see the problems, they're quite visible. Um, so that's one reason. But there's two or three other reasons. So, so um, a good quality product with no defects for the, the customer, a good quality product with no defects for safety reasons and, and sadly post Grenfell. Um, uh, the Grenfell Fire in London, uh, you know, we recognise that actually we need to build uh, to a higher quality in terms of our safety standards. And sometimes, I think what's been found, at, well, will be found at Grenfell and has been found with some other studies is that although in theory, the product has a really good um, fire safety or uh, um, quality, actually because of what happens on site and other people coming in and then messing around with it by punching holes into it, drains through or water supply or whatever, that, that gets compromised. You wouldn't get that in a factory built home and then finally the energy efficiency will be much better as well so basically the opportunity of the product comes off with much higher um, levels of certainty around its, its performance is good for people good for safety and good for good for um, the environment as well you mentioned there are a couple of the problems that people might experience without obviously naming any names of, of some of the um, uh, organizations and employers that, that criticism have been at what sort of examples might you think of that, that people listening to this podcast could recognise in their own homes that aren't the kind of problems that you're talking about in, in housing stock that maybe hasn't been um, looked at by the public? It, it, it will vary from, 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 um, from place to place, but, but often it's around, um, what do you think, and that comparison of you do it on a factory where everybody's sort of working together, and I'm not saying they're not on the building side, but on the building side, you'll have lots of different trades working around each other, trying to do different things, and that can create problems. So actually, and the opportunity, you know, it's all about measurement. You, know, you might get a measurement slightly wrong, so that measurement might mean your doors are a bit closer to do or your windows are a bit looser and actually what they might then do is put lots of foam in to, to sort of insulate it but it's not as fitting well as it could be or your um, the finishing might not be great so the, the skirting board might not be right or some of the electrics don't quite work in the most serious cases some of the fire um, capabilities and fire um, retarding uh, that they call it you know to stop a fire um, fire spreading quickly when it happens might not be as good as it could be and actually some of the house builders have done some studies and reviews of their own product and found that to be a problem so it, it's a multitude from very small to really quite serious um, I've there's even an example which I've seen with just the most ridiculously wavy brick wall which was at the extreme 
but how anybody could have allowed that to be passed and say that's fit for somebody to move into is, is beyond me but it literally it looked like they purposely offset the bricks slightly so instead of having a flat brick wall you had this little bumpy brick wall uh, but that was just through lack of beauty lack of training for the person who did the brickwork in the first place and the lack of somebody checking it off and saying you know this is good enough for a new person to move into Wow, my goodness. I know. It, it, is, it is shocking. It's a shocking example. I wish I could show it to you. Maybe, maybe, we, can, maybe we can get up on the podcast. Yeah, it doesn't we, say which house builder it is. Okay, maybe we can certainly set, uh, supply some links with this um, to, to show some examples of this kind of thing. That It's one thing to have minor problems, as you say, that sort of snagging that, that needs to be resolved, but houses that potentially don't fit and want to move be right up there as an issue. Um, I know that this is something that you've talked about before or, or mentioned before, that with all of these consumer products, the, the power rests with the consumer. If things stop being of value, if things stop being fit for purpose, consumers stop buying them. There is a, a number of pieces of research that suggest that particularly the millennial generation, those born sort of just before and around the millennium, um, actually don't really aspire to own houses anymore. It's not something that's important to them. Research suggests that Generation Z, the next generation that the country that were born uh, in the mid-2000s, are more interested, but it's interesting to see perhaps that people maybe aren't that interested in the product that we're creating because it's not fit for purpose anymore. I think that's a really it's a question i ask myself as well um and, and i think some of the builders are beginning to think this too that we might have a shift now it's almost been i talked about that supply and demand issue there's you know there's more demand than there is supply and whether that happens it means you've got reduced choice uh, and you, you'll be happy to get not to get any home but to get a home which is which is good enough rather than uh, as good as it could be if you like so it could be so much better in my view I think there's an interesting question around some of these new generations as to whether they're going to say, actually, do you know what? It's, it's not the quality I want. It's not um, as carbon efficient and as good for climate change as I want. And I don't want to have that, thank you. I'd rather have nothing or rent somewhere. I mean, rent is another thing. It may be that future generations are going to say, I would rather rent and have money available to do other things and sink all of my money into a home. Um, if you look at the rest of Europe, we're, we're quite exceptional in terms of our home owning and um, mm. essentially we have, we have owning homes. And maybe we're beginning to move, although we've moved away from Europe in some aspects, uh, we might be moving closer to, closer to Europe in others, that actually we're beginning to see a generation who'd say, actually, you know what, you know, my disposable income and income to spend on, on things I want to do and experiences is as important to me as having somewhere else. Having said that, it will then become a trade between am I spending so much money on rent per annum you know, per month that actually if I put that into a home, I'd actually be having an economic asset. So that's part of that discussion. But I think there is an interesting question around whether the quality is good enough. Um, and we know there are examples to say it can be so much better. To me, part of the problem goes back to that thing I said at the beginning, that for house builders, they sell the property and as soon as they sell the property, that's it, There's, their interest is gone. For councils and for housing associations, they're much more interested in how that house runs. And actually in terms of cost, the cost of a house to build cheaply might be more expensive to run if you see what i mean so that the upfront cost to buy it might be cheaper but actually because it's not as energy efficient because it's got some problems with it it will cost you more to run the house now if you've got a long-term interest that equation starts changing mm -hmm. so you might you might pay more up front to have a more energy efficient home or a home with more features that you want and actually that that is another interesting question where people are going to start seeing you know I would be willing to pay a bit more to have a better experience and a, and a, and a lower heating bill, et cetera. And actually over time, that will probably pay for itself anyway. You mentioned uh, a little while ago about the competitions and things that you're running. Can you tell us about some of the progress that you're making in, in all parts of Moby to, to really embed this message, to get this out there? Because it sounds like it's something that, that really is a, a, an opportunity potential for young people to come and help the challenges of changing these mindsets involved. Absolutely. So, so I mean, Moby is only two years old. I say only. We've, we've achieved a lot in two years, which is which is fantastic. But we want to achieve so much more. So, um, our design competitions, the one we've got, the one we've done now, which is actually with the government department uh, over twenty thirty, um, is 
has had twice the amount of entries that we've had in our previous competitions, but we'd love it to be so much bigger. Yeah, we'd love to engage everybody in the built environment. I, I am passionate about the built environment as an industry um, and, and as an experience. So the thing about buildings is you see them every day um, and you're either slightly blind to them or you notice them. Um, and I think having had a geography interest, I sort of notice them. Um, but it's really exciting that you could be involved in that industry. That industry create, can create wonderful places for people to live. Just think about the places you enjoy um, the most. Well, somebody has had a place in shaping that maybe over many, many years, centuries maybe as a brand new development but they've actually thought about it and there's a whole team of different people doing that work so there might be architects and engineers and planners and people they call surveyors people who do sort of the numbers and calculations around the cost there's a whole set of different skills going in to create those places um, and so that's really exciting because you can make some really lovely places for people to live it's great in terms of climate because about 40 percent of our energy emissions in the uk come from the built environment be that how when we built it or how we run it massive potential there to make things better as well but for me it's a really exciting industry so we're doing this the challenges to try and raise awareness and um, we've done those from probably 11 to 25 we're about to experiment in primary school as well to see whether it engages um, children a, a young uh, a young age in many ways we hopefully all have a home for those few of us who don't that's an issue in itself but you can relate to the home it's re you can understand the home you know how your home works and therefore you can compare your home to something else and just think about everything going on in your home well that was all built by somebody designed by somebody created by somebody electro electricians engineers plumbers all came in to to help build it you know all of those industries are what we'd love people to get involved in and change they, they come with a different thinking um, maybe some of that millennial thinking we we're talking about which changes the product uh, and then we've got the education that we're providing which is sort of a different route into house design and house manufacturers we describe it rather than building but thinking about how you might design and build homes in a different way I and mean, again it's you know it's for future generations it's their their built environment that they're going to be looking after and they inherit and we want them to have a much bigger say in what it looks like do you work with other organizations other institutions i know that you you mentioned there some of the qualifications and the btex and things that you're you're running do you work with other sort of parts of of life of, of community of industry that young people could see and get involved in and, and understand are there ways that they can take steps to to join what you're doing yeah so so actually we did pretty much all of this through through partnership um so with our education providers maybe have we've helped create some of the the, the writing of the modules and designing of some of the assignments and and the, you know the, the experiences going out on field trips looking at fact um, factories where houses are being made there's a few of those around now in the uk um, lots in other countries we'll come back to that you know the uk is way behind the rest of the world in, in how we do that, that element of house building um but we do that but then it's provided by others so i talked about the um the btex certificates diplomas we've worked with um, international education company pearson to provide those so they provide those and actually they have 120 built environment colleges around the country who can be picking those units up as part of the construction and built environment um, offers that they have we're then working with a, a small number of universities again we want to enlarge it but currently teesside uh, university of wolverhampton birmingham city university university of northumbria providing that's the bachelor's the msc the phd uh, at, the, at the very top level that r d level um and we're obviously working with other construction partners as well so some of the design challenges we've done with people like um design engineer construct who do, who do work in schools um uh, construction innovation hub who are a government funded uh, scheme all about trying to change the way we do construction and bringing in thinking from other countries and other places other other, other manufacturing sectors so yeah we're doing we're working with every part of industry we can to sort of try and change these individual firms as well uh, the primary school challenge i mentioned we're doing with a with a private house builder who are, who are really interested in seeing how they can use that to engage the future occupiers of their homes and hopefully also the future builders of those homes as well fantastic it sounds like such a collaborative project it's a, a great way i think for industry to show that we can do things together um, not just competing against each other you mentioned earlier about climate change and sustainability and obviously those are um, issues trends that that people are very well aware of there are children going out from on strike from school to protest and, and bring awareness to the climate emergency um, 
this this movement towards better um, is this something that you think people can get involved in tackling this problem themselves in their existing houses this is something that they could start to learn more about and understand perhaps looking at their own environment where they live uh, absolutely I, I love that expression movement towards better so 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 who wouldn't want to have a movement towards better in everything so so I think that we go back you know, maybe there's some parts of the industry who might be a bit more um, uh, challenged by this. Actually, they probably recognise they could be better. They'll be interested in whether that affects the profits or not, but, but they probably want to create better. Nobody wants to go to work and create a bad thing. They want to create something that's good. So, but how can we do that better? Um, yeah, yes, just think about, if you think about sort of your house or your um, the place where your house is, just think about quite simply what works and what doesn't work. So how does the, are the rooms the right size? Somebody said to me, it's a killer question that youngsters have, which is why do lots of houses when they're built have a second and third bedroom of different sizes? So if you're in a, a family with two children, that immediately means there's going to be an argument between those two children to who gets your room. Well, actually, that's purely down to the cost of the house. That's where the cost up front has driven the house builders to say, well, we'll build a slightly smaller room because we can't fit two of the same size in. If they were thinking about the family and the problems it has when they moved in, there might be something different. And actually it's bringing that questioning of everything about, well, what if, what if we did that? Would that make it better? And that's the sort of mindset we want to come into the industry, asking really fundamental things like, you know, is the way we build now, which frankly hasn't changed in 100, 150 years in terms of being out on site, laying bricks, putting in plasterboard, all those sort of things. Well, what if we built that in a factory? What would happen then? Um, and there'll be issues with that, but actually it's asking those really big questions. So I think, yeah, fundamentally, that's absolutely what we want new generations to come through and do and challenge the way we do things. They call this, um, it's called process engineering in some places, and it's literally the simple fact of going in and asking the question, well, why do we do that? And often the answer is, well, we've always done it that way. <laughs> yes, but why, why do we do it? And they go, uh, I don't re know really. Well, what if we did that? And then it starts opening up endless possibilities so i think that's where where young generations is, can, can come in both with challenging what we've done already but also saying well and actually i don't live my lifestyle the way you guys used to you know i don't want probably i, I think that's about plugs now actually you probably want less plugs around the house and much more usb points in fact usb points will probably cease to be and it'll be something else soon but actually if you think about all the electronic devices it'd be much better to have a house with multiple usb points and maybe a few few less plugs than it used to just think of that level it's it's sort of how are the things that i do different and how should my thinking about how i want to live my life be influencing the people frankly in my generation who are used to living in a different way and need to be alerted to that that well i don't live that way so that that's what we're after and, and to me that's fabulously exciting not only for the youngsters coming in but as a challenge to us to think well how can we do better and actually what are we designing now, which is frankly for my generation, I won't tell you how old I am, but you know, actually doesn't meet the new, new generations because they want to do something different. And I think where you were talking before about that, where your house is as well, that that, that style, that, that, that trend is changing, that people perhaps in the 60s, 70s, as, as car ownership was a real boom and, and everybody wanted to own that and commute to work, that roads and infrastructure became the investment big big wide roads that everyone could travel down now actually more public transport and infrastructure is something that reflects the quality of a place as well the, those sort of connected thinking to where wherever you are you can get to wherever you need to be perhaps without being pulled into your own car and that just, <laughs> yeah, so that, that is now a delivery coming, so we, we'll, we'll have to do that one again. Sorry, he, he'll be going to say, this is a problem, my, my dog. I, I, I'll tell you, um, when I joined Moby, um, one of the things he had to do was do a, um, a camera interview to, into the computer. And my biggest, one of my biggest worries was the postman would turn up and I had a dog going woof, 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 woof in the background. <laughs> <laughs> um, that makes it very real. Give me a parcel, and I think my new dog is and, and then the third likelihood is the placement will turn up at some point, but probably after we finish. finished. <laughs> so, um, okay. Yeah, we'll do, we'll redo that one.
What dog do you have? Sorry about that, Catherine. He's just about to go now, so that's the dog should go far again. His way of saying hello, he just wants to say hello to everybody who comes to the house. <laughs> My dog thought that everyone was his new best friend. Every, you know, people in the street, everyone was suddenly yeah. the same way. What type of dog do you have? Uh, a Labradoodle. Oh, gorgeous. Yeah, yeah. So he's actually three quarters poodle, so he's more poodle than Labrador. But um, yeah, he, they don't molt. Uh, and I'm slightly allergic to dog hair, so that's one of the reasons we've got them. They're very good with kids, so that's the reason we've got one of those. Right, I'm just checking. Should be okay now. Okay. Uh, I can't quite remember how I started that, but I was talking about one of the issues with, you were talking before about where your house is and the, the situation that, it, that it's in, that houses built perhaps in the 50s, 60s, 70s, where car ownership was a real boom. People wanted to own cars, commute with cars. So the infrastructure around, the width of the road, the number of lanes, that was a real investment in cities. Now, actually, um, the, the placemaking part of home ownership and, and house building is less about car ownership. There are some places that don't even offer parking at all because the movement is much more towards public transport and the investment in that. So there's obviously that connected thinking as well about not just where you live, but how you get to wherever you need to go from there as well. Yeah, and that's the thing about placemaking. So your home is home is an individual unit, if you like, but actually how it sits with all those other units around, and that'll include you know, um, employment and um, where you go to shop, uh, and, and where I actually go for you know for entertainment and your and experiences, uh, and then actually how that relates to other places as well. So you're you're absolutely right. I think we've gone through sort of um, an evolution of the, the internal combustion engine made people be able to live a lot further away from where they worked, um, and that was fine, but now we understand that some of the negatives of that are the carbon, carbon emissions and what that might be doing to, to our climate. Um, and actually we've seen that evolution, not only driven by car, but actually just driven by the way people live actually. So um, a lot of the city centers, you know, were, were incredibly busy in the industrial revolution. And then actually as, the, as people moved out and could go elsewhere, they became quieter, but actually people moved back into cities because of not only transport, but just because they're quite likely places to live. Um, so uh, so you've, you've seen, you know, derelict buildings become converted and turned into um, residential and back into offices. So you've actually seen that sort of movement. And I think we've got more of that to come. Doesn't mean that we're all suddenly gonna move and live in the center of the cities. We need to think about how, um, the places where we have built become more sustainable so actually the move to electric cars is an interesting challenge so but what does that mean actually you know if we think about uh, an environment where what's it by 2030 we won't be we won't be selling any more um fossil fuel based cars well what's the infrastructure we need to that going to have for that are we going to have charging points at garages do we need to have charging points out the, outside each people's homes we're going to have to think about that in terms of place making as well but i think we will see more concentration and definitely concentration around public transport um, nodes. And I always think about, if you know London at all, you know, the tube map and some of the Metropolitan Line in particular, but a couple of the other lines were actually built around putting a line out that they would then build houses and communities around who would then commute back into London. So they weren't serving existing communities. It's all built around, if you build the transport infrastructure and people can get into the city easily, you can, might enable them to live further out, maybe more affordable, maybe a bit greener. So actually, how are we going to pull all those things together with all the challenges we have? That, that's a, a headache, but it's also a massive challenge as well, a big opportunity to do things differently. And perhaps a way for young people listening to this to think about what the the evolution of their own towns and cities might be, where where people could be building, not just to take over greenbelt land and, and build on um, beautiful beautiful woodland, but to expand your towns and cities. And and what will the future look like? What will the next fifty or hundred years look like? Where people are wanting 
local neighborhoods that have their own personality, their own characteristics, their own traits, their own narratives, but still being able to access those central um, features as well. Yeah, so you can think about some real, some real examples. So we talked about the car, and actually, if we if we're more using more electric vehicles, who knows, self self driving vehicles in the future. How does that change a place, and how the place need to adapt? Um, we can clearly see massive change in the retail environment. Much more shopping online, you know, high streets changing, you know, suffering a bit. Well, actually, the high street of the future is going to be smaller. So, so what happens to those formal shops? What do you turn those into? They don't become all sort of bars and restaurants. You're going to have a mixed use there. Probably more people moving in, potentially converting some of those back into accommodation. So just those two, where we can see the change already happening, well, what does think what that looks like in 10, 20, 30 years time? Um, and then there's probably things we, we haven't even thought of, which are going to affect it as well. So you, could, you can sort of do both. Here's something I know is already changing and how might we need to adapt to that change and then also you know based based on how i live and how i want things to be um what change would i have if i have if i had the sort of magic wand and could say this is how i change our built environments so it better suited my my needs because your needs younger generations needs are different to ours and what you want will be different and again it's how do we build new places which meet those needs and adapt to the existing places which is a massive challenge in itself so we, if we're building one million house, um, three million houses per, sorry, three hundred thousand houses per annum, we've got 27, 28 million houses already built in the UK. And let's think about, you know, how are we going to have to change those? What does that require? So it's not just about new build; it's about how you adapt to what we have already. There is a campaign out at the moment for one of the professional bodies that with, exist within the construction industry saying that the greenest building is the one that already exists, that actually that sort of retrofit, bringing things back to life in perhaps new and different ways, but using those existing buildings is going to be um, a, a really crucial part of, of the future design of, of this sort of piecing together this jigsaw that is the built environment. Absolutely, and and so actually some really exciting opportunities exist there. So, so just thinking about you know um, places I know, um, uh, Manchester. Um, just think about the centre of Manchester. It had all these massive, big Victorian buildings built by very rich industrials who who really wanted to show off you know their, their some of their richness. They built beautiful buildings, but as soon as the industry collapsed and we weren't manufacturing things in Manchester anymore. Well, what happened to those? Well, they stood empty for years and years and years. And then in the sort of 1980s, part of the release of the Manchester, people went, oh, they're lovely buildings. Hey, wouldn't they be great places to live or to have a hotel in? And if you walk around now, you can see some of these fa fantastic former industrial warehouses, which are now really amazing apartments to live. But it's not just old industrial buildings. There's a place in Sheffield, if people know it, called Park Hill, which is some 1960s houses, um, massive 1960s estate built up on the, the hill overlooking Sheffield. Um, which fell into dilapidation and became really redundant and actually not a place that anybody would want to live. And then a company called Urban Splash, who have a particular record in, in taking on these hard, hard places, have now turned that into the most desirable apartments in the whole of Sheffield. Um, so they took something that nobody wanted to live in and with a bit of imagination and a lot of effort, turned that into somewhere where people are now sort of pushing each other out aside to try and get and live. And, and that's the exciting thing, looking at today's unwanted, unloved, building maybe and thinking that yeah but if we use it a different way that could become tomorrow's lovely building so so that's why i love the built environment it's dynamic it's not uh, it's forever changing and actually bringing new thinking can make something which looks like um you know ugly and not unloved into something that people love and really cherish which i think is amazing yeah you know, taking a building which which everybody used to turn their back on and think was awful and now they're going, oh, isn't that an amazing, cool place? Um, um, wouldn't it be fantastic if you, would, you were part of delivering that? Fantastic. I think I will put in some links at the end of the podcast so that uh, teachers and careers leads can um, source some of the references that you're talking about there. But I think for young people, uh, maybe, maybe do that. Walk around, look at the places around you in your town, your city, look at your high street and the way that it's changing, the location of your house, perhaps some of the areas that are renowned for being unloved, unwanted, um, and, and think about what they could be, how, how we could change this together with, with your input, with your expertise, with your lived experience of knowing your, your town city. As you say, that um, 
one of the issues with really big housing developments is that they start to take away the personality of a particular area and I think keeping that as much as possible lends very much to that place making. I think absolutely. Um, you know, what, what it's, once you turn onto the built environment, you'll never look at a place in the same way. You're always looking at it and, and, and almost reading it. It's like reading a book um, or a picture and you're looking and thinking, well, well, yeah, so, so why is that building there and, and who built it and what was it for and, and what's it doing now? And actually, it's also worth just looking back at even recent history. So I was talking about the 1980s. You know, there, are, there are parts of towns and cities all over the UK which in the 1980s were in you know, severe economic decline and nobody loved. And now many of those neighbourhoods are the, the highest demand neighbourhoods. So not only is there a sort of opportunity to change places, there's, there's a big economic opportunity there as well for people. You know, and some people have made a lot of money in terms of spotting those places that nobody loves, but thinking, you know what, there's something about this place that's got real potential, e either as a sort of existing buildings there or a canvas of if we recreated that community and rebuilt some stuff there it would be an amazing place because its location is fantastic maybe what's built there now doesn't look brilliant but something different could work really well and i, I think that's just such an exciting opportunity and and, and if you look at if you ever get into the history of cities you know, and see how they change over time and how technology changes them and people's habits and change they're, they're like an organism they are they're, they're constantly evolving and changing and actually being part of that helping them adapt and change and become reach their potential is just so exciting. So how can people get involved in what you're doing? How can people spread the word? How can people sign up? How can people share your enthusiasm for it? Yeah, so we'll, we'll start with we'll Watch Moby's website. The obvious thing is is one of the, our next design challenge, which will probably be, we haven't quite planned it yet, but we, I suspect the end of this end of this year. Um, keep an eye out for the Home of 2030. So it's www.homeof2030.com because we'll be, um, the, 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 the deadline for that was the end of uh, February. We're now into the judging phase and we'll have our finals in uh, 22nd of May, I think. Um, so keep out an eye out for those and the inspiring ideas that people come up with. And, and something I've learned from Moby, so I've come into this um, organization having been in built environment 30 years. And what I have spotted in our young design challenges is it's the young people and, and normally the youngest who have the most amazing ideas and the most fantastic talent. There is endless talent to be unlocked there. And they and you naturally think outside the norm. You don't think about you know what can't be done. You think about what could be done. And once you thought about what could be done, then normally there's a boot. So it's very easy for, for us to say, oh, well, you couldn't do that because the regulations say you can't, or it will cost too much, or, or, or. Young people tend to go and go, well, what if we built a house in the shape of a beehive? And actually, once you've had that concept, and that was one of our winning entries, so I haven't plucked that from anywhere, um, you say, well, well, how do we make that happen? Because that's a brilliant idea. Um, and you'll, you will make it happen. And then engineers and designers and uh, economists can come in and say, well, this is how you make it work. So what I love about young people getting involved is they challenge never thought about and actually that's so so those design challenges if you're really interested in the career loads of careers in the built environment uh, architecture planning surveying um, engineering all sorts of opportunities um, just think you know we are surrounded by the built environment and it, it it hasn't happened by accident it happened by hundreds and thousands of people being involved in those industries but just think about well, what could I do do I like design well maybe that's an architecture's route for you do I like the structure of things and how they work, maybe engineering or, or interior design might be part of that. There are just, if you're interested, do research. Um, I stumbled across the built environment, lots of people do, but once I've stumbled across it, I never wanted to leave that industry. I just think it's the best place to work and the most exciting and one where you can really see the changes you create improve people's lives. Fantastic. That's so inspiring. I will share some of the links um, at the end of the podcast and, and link people into that. And I think as you're looking at your potential career prospects, you know, in, in the future, there are also courses and careers, um, qualifications that you can take and be involved in to give you a good grounding into some of these things so the BTEX that you were talking about some of the universities that you work with um, the DEC qualifications um, I'll, I'll share some of those as well is there anything else there that you think people should know about and that, that should be brought to their attention 
Well, I, I, I guess the other thing is, so, so obviously lots of stuff happens in the built environment because because you just look how much of it is there is. So there, there is that prospect. And I actually, in terms of one of the places to get involved in right now, it, it's really exciting because there's a lot of need. So actually, in terms of construction workforce, a lot of people are 50 nearly 20 percent of the, the, the construction workforce now is 50 percent or over uh, uh, 50 50 years or over and therefore there's a big need coming just in terms of people moving out of the industry and new people needing to come in but there's also we need to build all those new houses oh and by the way we want to be building lots of new infrastructure as well because that's part of the government's plans you know, hst you've heard about um maybe another runway at heathrow maybe not but lots of you know probably renewable energy um generation a whole bunch of infrastructure to be built it's a real industry where there's a massive demand. So not only is it an industry you can go into, I think get a lifetime's worth of fulfillment out of, um, change places for the better of the people, influence the environment to be to be better, it's an industry crying out for young talent as well. So I think I think it's you know it, it's worth doing that even just from the economic side of actually there's gonna be lots of jobs in this industry and there's lots of variety in this industry, but it's also because actually it's an industry if you're value based and you probably sense that I am you can drive so much satisfaction out of saying, well, I created that, I helped build that, I helped develop that place, and people are loving that, and that brings value, um, personal value and societal value. So that's that's one of the reasons I'd say that the built environment is career. Fantastic. Is there anything that I haven't asked you that you really want to to share, to tell people, to, to add to anything that you said previously? Um, no, I don't think so. I think we've probably covered most. Of it, but I think we've pretty much covered most of it in that. So that that seems fine to me. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Mark, so much for joining us today. Hopefully, this has really inspired you, wet your appetite to understand more about how your home came to be, the decisions, the choices that were made in where it is, why it is, what it's surrounded by, how well connected or not it might be to your town or city, your high street, um, the problems within your home or the things that work really well and, and understanding, as Mark expanded there, the different sizes of rooms, the decisions that will have gone into that, that might be purely economic at the time that they're made, but might have a massive impact on the choices um, and, and the way that you live your life within that building. Hopefully this has really inspired you. Thank you again, Mark, for joining us. Um, and please come back for our next episode of Build Better Stuff podcast. Thank you.